All right. So you probably guessed my opening uh, series this morning. I've entitled, We Are the Church, uh, Destiny Revealed uh, Through Our Service. Our destinies this morning, God gets involved as we prepare and open our lives up to become servants of the Lord. Not only servants of the Lord, but yet servants one to another. These are principles this morning that I want to take a look at with you uh, before we have communion. We're going to have communion at the end of our service this morning. And I want to use uh, as an introduction to my sermon this morning a picture of a Bible uh, a person named Rebecca. If you read it in Genesis chapter number 24, there, we're not going to read the whole chapter obviously, but it's a story of Abraham, and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 24, and it starts with verse 1, that Abraham was old in years, and that his son Isaac had not yet been married. And so what Abraham does is he has a servant, and he asks the servant, listen, do me a favor. I want you to go find a, a wife for my son, but I, I don't want you to just go anywhere. I want you to go to the land where I come from. And from my family, I want you to find a, a handmaiden, a wife uh, for my son. And so the servant, what a job, right? Just think if somebody asked you, go find a, a wife for, for your son. Some of you are already doing that, I know. <laughs> but here, here in our text, here's what's going on in our story of Rebecca. And uh, what takes place is Abraham's servant begins to pray. Boy, was he praying. Because he starts to ask questions, and he says, so what, what if, if she don't want to come, or if she don't come and I can't find anybody, do I bring your son to that land? Abraham said, no. Whatever you do, God brought us out of that land. I don't want, don't take him back. If you don't find anybody or nobody wants to come, well, then you're relieved of your obligation. So Abraham's servant goes to this place where Abraham is from. And I'm just kind of, of uh, encapsulating the story really quickly for you. And uh, he prays, and he goes, and his prayer is, Lord, I pray that you bring a handmaiden, and that uh, if she comes and, and offers me, and I ask her to give me water, that she would willingly do this and serve me. And so let's pick up the story and uh, verse number um, thir or 12 out of the book of Genesis chapter 24. And he says, Then he prayed, Lord God my, of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show your kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside the spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say uh, to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder and she was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Naor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had slept with her. And she went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. And the servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. And after she had given him a drink, she said, I will draw for your water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. And so she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back uh, to the well to draw more water and drew enough for all his camel. And so we find here that uh, as uh, Abraham's servant came to meet Rebekah here or to meet, to, to find a handmaiden for Isaac, here we find in one simple act of service, think about Rebecca's life. She was just a town's, a, a, a girl in a town with many other girls, but yet 
she made a decision that when Abraham's servant uh, asked for some water, through this act of service, one simple act of service, you read about Rebecca's life and how she became part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. She entered into destiny because of, of this one simple act of, of service. I want to look with you this morning and think about this through the life of Jesus. And with you and I, the same as Rebecca, as we open our lives to become the servants, not only of God, but of those around us, God will begin to unfold his plan for our lives and bring us into our destinies that he has prepared for us. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 13, we see that Jesus begins to speak to the disciples, and he's talking about his love. Because how many know service is born out of a love for people? When you love people, you have a desire to serve people. And so Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And in John chapter 13 and verse 34 and 35, he brings a new revelation to the disciples. And he says, I give you a new command that you must love each other as I have loved you. If you love each other, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And he says it again, if you love one another. And so Jesus is bringing out uh, these truths to, to the disciples because he's going to do something right after this and he's going to begin to show them what love is all about. And the two truths that we see here that Jesus is speaking about, number one, that we're to love others like he loves us. Don't you thank God for God's love in your life? Don't you thank God that his unconditional love, in spite of our lives, praise God for that, that's called grace, that he loves us in spite of our failure, in spite of our, our, our idiosyncrasies that drive people crazy sometimes. That in spite of when we are unlovable, how many have ever been unlovable? <laughs> some of you are unlovable right now. Show me some love. Come on, be nice. In spite of all that we go through and that we are, God still loves us. Amazing grace there, right? And this is the way that we're to love other people, just like he loves us. Why? Because he said that our love, when we show love to others, it indicates and it shows and reveals to the world and to people around us uh, that we are truly disciples of Jesus Christ. That we are really the church, the sons uh, of God. And so we need to understand that Jesus says that we're to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he goes on and says, and our neighbors as ourselves. So not only do we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but listen, it doesn't stop there. You need to love your neighbors. Turn to your neighbor and say, hi, neighbor. I love you. Come on now, you can do that. Well, make sure it's your husband or your wife, okay? Don't, don't, this, is not, this is not a dating game here, okay? Love your neighbor as ourselves. We love ourselves, don't we? We do take care of ourselves. The root word for neighbor means nigh, to draw near, or to be close to someone. And so the picture that Jesus is saying here, because he's going to be giving them an illustration in a, in, in, a, in a short while, he says that you're not only to love those uh, in the church are those that you know are those who are lovable that you can love and make you feel good like loving them, but you're to love those outside of these walls. Love your neighbor, draw close to them and bring to them and show them the love of Jesus Christ. It's called evangelism, amen. 
It's called getting out of our comfort zones. Uh, and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, and beginning to show God's love. Ex exhibit God's love to those uh, that maybe we haven't spoken to. You go to the markets. We go to school. We go to our places of employment. And so in the Gospel of John, chapter number 13, we read as Jesus spending, he spends the, the last evening, the last night with the disciples before the Garden of Gethsemane, before he's betrayed and before the cross. He sets up a meal with the disciples, and it's a typical type of supper, a place where in this room there is a servant, and uh, that servant was, is there with, with the room. It's almost like when you rent the hall, there's certain things that come with the hall. There was a servant uh, with uh, the room that they were meeting to have this uh, uh, supper, and along with that room came a servant. What was that servant's job? Well, that servant's job was to wash the guest's feet. That's what his job was. Why? Because getting to that room, there were no paved roads, sidewalks, curbs, little hand sanitizers. The folks had to trail and walk through all kinds of debris and mud and dirt and gook and where animals walked and whatever took place there, they stepped in it and walked through it. And so when they came into the room, it was proper etiquette for this servant to wash their feet. So we have that picture, but something was going on. Something happened. There was supposed to be a servant there. They looked around, where's the servant? Our feet are dirty and they smell. And they started thinking, and they wondered, well, who's going to wash our feet? And they began to play the pecking order game. Well, they looked at each other. There's 12 of them there. Let's see. Peter, James, and John thought about it. It ain't going to be us because we were here first. It's okay. Who's the last one to get saved? Who's the last one to know Jesus? That's the guy that's going to wash our feet. Isn't that human this morning? We're looking around for somebody to serve us instead of us looking to serve somebody. The last one in the pecking order, almost like, like kids, when a family has a lot of children, you know, they, it's like, you know, they go have five kids and they go like this. Poor kid at the end, right? Poor kid at the end, because that's the kid that gets all the guff. That's the kid that has to do all the things. Why? Because it's the older one that says, you need to do that. Sister Nancy told me stories about her, her older brother and Pastor Sergio, and how her and her older brother used to pick on Pastor Sergio, make him do all the dirty work, get him in trouble. But he was spoiled, and his parents loved him best. That's why they were jealous. But that's the pecking order. Let's find out who was the youngest and they're thinking, especially Peter, well, maybe they're, they're, he's the one, they're the ones that are going to wash our feet because we're in the inner circle. But what happens? Jesus surprises them all, takes off his robe, picks up a towel, he dips it in water, and he begins to come over and clean and to wash their feet. Peter gets angry and he says, no. No. Why did he get angry? Because Peter thought, hey, if I was in charge of this group, I sure would be washing feet. Somebody else would be doing it. See, that was Peter's mindset when it came to serving. But Jesus had a different idea. He said, Peter, listen to me. And he rebukes Peter. He said, if I can't wash your feet, then you have absolutely nothing to do with me at all. And then Peter said, well, if that's the way it's going to be, then give me a bath. 
wash my feet, my hair, my body, do whatever you need to do, because I want to be part of the kingdom of God. That's interesting, because Jesus modeled servanthood. He modeled the, the attitude that you and I need as the people of God, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that whenever we find an opportunity to serve, no matter what it is or who it is, that we should model after Jesus Christ. He gave us the example of serving. It was the attitude that he had. The attitude, and Jesus was trying to show these disciples that I have a destiny for your life. And that destiny is linked to, to your attitude of service. Not only to God, but to one another. That's why he said, love one another, even your neighbor as yourselves. Let's look at Jesus' attitude of service. Because it was a mindset that we as the people of God need to develop in our lives. Number one, his mindset that maybe we need to come to the understanding was that Jesus was secure in his calling, who he was as the son of God, and he had nothing to prove. He knew his mission. He knew what God had the Father had called him to do, and he knew his destiny. And because of that, he was able to put aside his lordship and, and him being God in the flesh and come to a place where he was willing to serve. Why? Because he was secure in his calling. He didn't have to push his weight around or prove to the disciples or anybody else who he was about his position. His security came through God's love, caused him to care, to go beyond his title, to go beyond his, his standing and minister and serve people. That's important when you, you're, you're secure in who you are in Christ. It's critical because insecurity will cause you to pull back and to begin to doubt your destiny, begin to doubt God's calling and God's love in your life. That's why the devil loves to make people feel insecure. You see, it's the security. Listen to me carefully. It's Jesus' security in God the Father that helped him to endure the, be the betrayal of Judas there at the up in, 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 in that, that dinner because he knew it was going to be Judas. And it was because Jesus was secure in his destiny that no matter who betrayed him, that he was still the Son of God and that he, God still had a destiny for his life. That's the importance of security. It was his security in God the Father's love that allowed him to go and uh, stand before Pilate uh, and be mocked and be betrayed and be beaten and be led to the cross. It was security that caused him to be able to turn the other cheek when the beating came. The question this morning is, how about us? What does our security in Christ look like? Do we have something to prove when we're around people because of insecurities that cause us to not serve or to treat people badly? So important that we begin to ask the question, Jesus was secure in his standing as the Son of God concerning who he was. We know the scripture says that he understood. He didn't come to what? Be served, but to serve. He was secure in that position. This is why a lot of times people won't serve in the ministry, won't serve in church, because they're insecure in their relationship with Jesus Christ. We could go on and on forever on that. They've been hurt. They've been betrayed. They, 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 they've been backstabbed, etc., and so on. They've been let down. And so because of that, those things and the fact that their security in Christ isn't what it should be, they pull back. And it hinders them in their destiny. Philippians 2, verse 5 and 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ 
Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no zero reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. This was a mindset. You see, Jesus was totally surrendered to his Father. This would cause him to be secure in who he was and what his mission was about and his destiny. He was totally surrendered. You see, when we pull back our lives, when we are not surrendered completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, there's an insecurity that takes place. And he, it opens the door for the enemy to begin to lie to us. You see, he was willing, Jesus was willing to turn his life over to God the Father. And he says, not my will be done, but let your will be done. Complete and total surrender. This is what caused him to serve and to lay down his life for a world that was lost and a world that is broken. And it's because of his security in God the Father and his total surrender that caused him to want to serve people, to want to be a servant, to not worry about his position or his title. And we find that the characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for people broke down the barriers around him and caused him to help people. That's what God wants from us as the body of Christ. That's what he wants for, uh, from us. He wants all barriers that may be hindering us from serving people to be broken down. Because there are folks that need help. How many can say amen to that this morning? There are folks that need help, not only in our church, but yet outside, obviously, of these four walls. People hurting and looking for assistance in their lives. And that's what God calls us to do, to lose sight of who we are and look for someone to help. I read a story I shared before about a Special Olympics. And uh, this group of, of young people that were involved in the Special Olympics, it was a, the, the event was a 100-yard dash. And it was for the mentally and physically disabled. And so they all lined up. And they got ready to run this race, and the starter's gun went off, and they all took off on this 100-yard dash, doing the best they could. And as they were running, one of their, their fellow competitors fell down. And so what they did was they were running, they saw, and they saw him fall down. They all stopped. And they went back, and they picked up this one who fell and they picked them up, and they all crossed the finish line together. Wow. All of them. We can learn from those special folks a thing or two. Learn to love and to care for one another, to minister, to help one another. Cross the finish line and not just be so concerned about me and my bones. No matter whose job it is or whose job it isn't. Because we can get caught up in that. that. That's not for me to do. That's the pastor's job. Those are the disciples' job. They're the ones that are supposed to serve. And too many times it's the people of God that get caught up in this kind of mentality that it's not my position or not my Job. Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes in verse 4, and he says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, parentheses, her own interests, but also for the interests of others. Are we doing that in our service to God? 
Is it just about us crossing the finish line? I haven't got time to help other people because I, I have my family. I've got this. And I'm not saying don't, don't take care of your family. Don't do what you have to do. I get that. But, I mean, think about the 24 hours we have in a day and how many hours there are in a year and determine how many of those hours do we spend helping other people. And that should give us a clear picture of our attitude and mindset when it comes to our service, whether it is just about us or do we look on the interests of others also. That's why I love so much about our church and I love so much about the ministries we have in our church. We do so many things here for people outside of these four walls through our focus ministry, through all the different events that we have. It's about helping others, about getting involved in others. And thank God for people who will do that, who will take time out of their Saturday, take time out of their Thursday night, take time out of their Tuesday night, take time out of their Sunday night, take time out of their Monday, take time out of their what's, what days are left. And they serve others. Thank God for those folks, but how many know we can use a lot more? We can use a lot more. And then this is where I think about Rebecca and how I'm sure she had chores to do. I'm sure there were things she had to maintain and take care of. That's why she went to the, 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 the well to get some water. But she put that on hold to serve a complete stranger. And not only the stranger, but his camels, stinky, smelly camels. She brought water for them. And you know, in those days, it took work to get water. Turn on the tap, go to the fridge, push the little button, ice comes out, water comes out. took a lot of work to get water in those days. And she did that because of, a, of a, a mindset and heart of service. And it caused her to enter into her destiny. You see, we think about the things that, that well, you know, I'm so busy and I've got so many other things that are surrounding me. I, I really haven't got time to wash anybody's feet. I haven't got time to, to, to go out of my way. Somebody else can do it. Just like the disciples. I wonder who's going to wash the feet. You see, what we need to learn to do is to build bridges to destiny. Build the bridges to the, the, the call of God, to the ability, build those bridges that will serve people, that will bring us a, across towards a, the destiny that God has prepared for us. I think about the Apostle Paul as we, we talked about Jesus. In chapter 9, 1 Corinthians he gives us a good example of how to break down obstacles in order to reach people and care for people and show them the love of Christ, whether in church or outside of church. Bridges, building bridges of God's love that can hold up the weight of the brokenness, the weight that people carry around upon them, the hurt, the disappointment, the disillusionment this world brings. It's God's love that as we build that bridge towards those folks uh, that can help them make it through to the other side to experience God's blessing and experience God's destiny. And if we don't do it, then who is going to do it? If we don't sacrifice and take the time 
The Apostle Paul became a neighbor. He drew close. He drew nigh to the different people around where he was in, in, the, in, in the city of Corinth. It was a port city. And there were so many diverse types of people there. So many diverse thoughts of religion, of God, of, 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 of life. And the Apostle Paul was able to build bridges of God's love through what? His service to them. In verse 3, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians, and we're just going to kind of bounce through as we start to wind this down. He begins to have a conversation, and he's talking about himself and Barnabas, who's with him. And he says, when people question me, Paul says, I tell them that Barnabas and I have the right to our food and drink. Because they're saying, what right do you have? You're not part of this, or you don't belong to this. And he says, we have a right to the food and to the drink. And then in verse 5, he goes on and says, we each have the right to marry one of the Lord's followers and take her along with us. So they're questioning who they are. They're questioning their ministry. They're questioning uh, their service to Christ. And Paul says, you know, we have rights. In fact, three times he says, we have rights. And uh, what Paul is doing is he said, we've abandoned our rights in order to serve people. We have abandoned our rights in order to build bridges to help people experience God's love. And that's one of the first things we need to learn to do is to abandon our rights. Isn't that what Jesus did? He abandoned his right as the son of God to become a bond servant. Three times Paul says that we have the right in fact, he says that we even have greater rights. Isn't that where most fights start? Family quarrels, marriages, kids. When we feel our rights have been violated, how many know we have our own Bill of Rights? <laughs> Here's our Bill of Rights. I know our government has a Bill of Rights, but make sure you read mine because there's a big list here and you better make sure that you, you understand this because it's what I expect of you if you're going to marry me. This is what I expect of you if you're going to be my friend. These are my Bill of Rights. And when any one of those rights is violated, you can't be my friend anymore. I, you can't be my wife or my husband anymore. And we love to flaunt our Bill of Rights, don't we? You're in your car. I had the right of way. What's that jerk doing? <laughs> we all come to a place where we value our rights. We don't want to surrender them. Paul said, hey, we have rights, but we haven't used this right of ours. He says, we're willing to put up with anything to keep from causing trouble for the message of Christ. Wow. Whatever it takes to keep harmony and not defile the testimony, the message of Christ, I'll surrender my rights. That's huge. How many of us are willing to surrender our rights? Well, I have a right to my free time. I have a right to this, and I have a right to that, and I have a right to this, and ba da 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 Are we willing to surrender our rights? Paul also accepted his responsibility. He understood that to build a bridge of love and to reach people, no matter who they are, and to tear down some of our walls that we build up that keep us from helping people, he understood there's a responsibility that comes with my calling, a responsibility that comes with being a Christian. How many can say amen to that? Gave up his rights and accepted his responsibility for caring for people, for helping people, for putting other people first, like Jesus did. In verse 16 and 17, he says, I'm not only willing to give up my rights, 
I'm willing to understand that I am responsible for people because he had been entrusted the stewardship of people. We've been entrusted, God has entrusted us through his son, Jesus Christ, the stewardship of helping people. As Christians, it's not only a gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy. But it's not what can I give? How can I help? That's stewardship that God has given to us. Paul learned from Jesus. So we go back quickly to the basin of Jesus washing people's feet and washing the disciples and showing them what a servant was really about. Two examples when a basin was used in the Bible, both of them in the same 24-hour period. Think about that. First, Jesus picks up the basin to serve and to show God's love and God's amazing uh, uh, determination to let people know, I'm here to help you. I'm here to serve you. And then we have the other account a little while later. The second person wasn't named Jesus, but his name was Pilate. And when Jesus came before him, and uh, he did not want the responsibility, the stewardship of having to make a decision about what was going to be taking place with Jesus. He said, bring me the basin. And what he did was he dipped his hands and basically said, I'm not my brother's keeper. Kind of like some of us do. Well, it's not my job. It's not my position. It's not my responsibility. And so instead of picking up the basin of serving, we pick up the basin that Pilate used. And basically, like Cain said, not my responsibility. Paul picked up the basin of responsibility. And he also adjusted to the needs of people. Are we willing to adjust our lives to meet people's needs? Are we willing to get out of our comfort zones? Well, I don't relate to them. They're this kind of person, or they're this color person, or they have this, this type of, 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 of uh, uh, lifestyles, and, and we go on and on and on. And we build barriers, not of bridges of God's love to, 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 to help, but to oppose and to stop destiny. So Paul was willing to make changes in his life and adjust his life to help reach people. Verse 20 to 22, there in, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 9, he said, when I am with the Jews, I live like a Jew to win Jews. They are ruled by the law of Moses, and I am not, but I live by the law to win them. Obviously, dealing with the type of foods that they're not going to eat, he's not going to violate their, their, their uh, uh, lifestyle. And then verse 21 says, then again, when I'm with the people who are not ruled by the law, I forget about the law to win them. Of course, he said, I never really forget about the law of Christ. So he says, I don't go into a bar just because everybody's drinking. I start drinking. I don't go, I don't, I don't, I'm not sharing their bong with them. I'm not going into the friendly marijuana dealer shops that are out there and, hey, light me up. Because he says, I don't forget about the law of God or the lifestyle, or, or, or the, my testimony. He says, and when I'm with the people whose faith is weak, I live as they do to win them. In other words, I'm not Bible bashing them. I'm loving them. I'm caring about them. I'm doing whatever I can to win them. You see, Paul was willing to adjust his life and break down some barriers. I'm willing to adjust and adapt my life, whatever it takes. That's what Jesus did, didn't he? He left heaven, and he humbled himself to look like you and me. Those of you who think you're God's gift to women or men, he humbled himself to look like us. That'll bring us down a couple of notches, right? It's amazing how many Christians are unwilling to inconvenience themselves, to adjust themselves, and give up their likes, their priorities, their position, for the love of Christ 
to help somebody else. There's a reward for loving. As our music team makes their way up, the communion uh, gets ready to uh, be served. There's a reward. We love rewards, don't we? Yeah, we do. Look at your keychain. How many things do you have in your keychain? It gives you rewards, your gas rewards, your food rewards, drugstore rewards, blah, 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 blah. We love rewards. There's a reward that God gives us for loving and serving people. In verse 24, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, you know that many runners enter a race, but only one of them wins the prize. So run the race as to win a prize. It's going to be a payday. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 39, he talks about the rewards. And we love payday, don't we? No? Well, then just sign your check over to the church. If you don't love paydays, you don't love your check, just go ahead and sign it over to the church. That's cool. No, you love your check. You love paydays. God gives us a payday. I'm not talking about the candy bar either. Is, do they still make that? Okay, I'm not a candy person. Matthew 10, 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me, God. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a, a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. Now listen carefully. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Wow. Something as small as giving somebody a drink of water. You cafe workers, you got a lot of rewards logged up for, in heaven for you. Something as little as giving out some water. Jesus said, you will certainly not lose your reward. So many times we think that we have to do something big and huge, significant, in order to be a servant and to make it count in the eyes of God. But Jesus just shot that down. And he says, hey, just loving people, just serving people the best you can is going to bring you a reward. As we bow our heads for a few